Winter Latina Show. Hosted by IDM. Yes, we are live. Welcome, everybody. Hello, Nina. Welcome to the 18th episode. I know. Unbelievable. Welcome to another fun-filled installment of the Winter Latina Show. Much like we do every, every time, we'll talk about death and destruction, but we'll also talk about a very, very human story in this episode. So, Marcelo, I would like you to imagine the following situation, if you can. You are in a hospital, you are recovering from very serious injuries, you've been in a hospital for a while, and you're finally, finally getting better. So you probably feel a little bit anxious, a little bit exciting, excited about coming home, coming home to your wife, and you leave the hospital, you're, you're on crushes because of your injuries. In fact, this is an injury that's going to bother you probably for the rest of your life and you head home and eventually you arrive at your apartment building in a big city. And as you arrive at your apartment building, you see a horrifying scene. There are medical staff orderlies that are loading dead bodies onto a truck to transport them out. Now, to anyone, this would be shocking enough, but you get closer and closer and closer and you realize that your wife, the wife that you're going to see, the wife that you were excited to see coming home from the hospital after being gone for so long, recovering from serious injuries, she, she is one of the dead bodies. She's dead. You get closer and, and you realize, no, 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 she's not dead. She's breathing. She's breathing ever so faintly, but the medical staff are about to, to take everyone away. So you, you, you freak out. What are you doing? This is my wife. She's alive. She's breathing. She's breathing faintly. I can take care of her. But... The medical staff seems unmoved. They say, look, they, they all look like, like skeletons. They died from, from starvation. They died from, from illnesses related to starvation. Your wife, yeah, she might be alive now, but she's not even going to make it through for the ride. She's not going to make it through the truck ride. You better, you better let it go. And there's something inside you that, that tells you that, no, 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 you have to help her. There is a chance. And you get so angry that you almost fight them with your crutches. You're limping, you're limping from your injury and you try to fight them with the crutches. And, and finally, they give in. They, they let you have your wife. They let you take her away. And you do. And a miracle happens. You, you take care of her. And, and after many months, she survives. And I'm not sure whether it was the fact that it was your, your constant presence, your, your caregiving, she was all alone or whether it was the fact that she was now able to eat just a little bit more because she now had access to, to, to your rations. Maybe 150 grams of bread a day, maybe 250 grams of bread a day, depending on what month this was. And remember, this is, this is bread, but this is bread made with, with glue. This is bread made with glue, glue made from animal parts, just to get a little bit of protein a little bit of protein for, for you to survive. And somehow your wife survives and you survive because you are living under Nazi German siege in, in Leningrad for three years, almost 900 days. And many years later, almost, almost a decade later, she gives birth to, to a son. And she's in her 40s. And of course, it's not completely unheard of, of, of women having children in their 40s, but we do know that, you know, eventually female fertility goes down and, and then eventually it, it disappears. And this is a woman, your wife, she almost died. She almost died from starvation. She lived in horrible conditions under siege and, and she was able to conceive this child and have this child. And, and many decades later, in fact, just after a year, a year after she passes away, your, your, your son, your son ends up becoming a president. 
he ends up becoming a president of the biggest country in the world. In fact, he, he is still the president, he is still in power, and he ends up becoming one of the most important political leaders on, on the global scale. So, Marcelo, how, how would you feel in, in this situation? I know it's almost difficult to, to transport yourself into, into a situation like this because we're living in a, well, it's kind of hard to call it a relatively peaceful time. You, you know, maybe in, in your part of Europe, it's, it's peaceful right now. Um, obviously, we're talking about cold, death, destruction, winter, starvation, um, but how would you feel if you were, if you were, if you found yourself in this scenario? Uh oh, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. It's almost impossible to, to picture myself in that scenario. I, I was not uh, born in uh, um, in a rich family, but uh, my family had always enough and more than enough. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm from Rio de Janeiro, and. Uh, I uh, will say misery, even misery in Rio de Janeiro is not um, as rush as that. And maybe some people will give me some push on that. But the truth is that, yeah, uh, it's I mean, warm. It's warm. <laughs> I guess yeah, that would be the one correction. It's not. It's, it's warm. Not uh, significantly, you know, below freezing mm -hmm. for many months. Well, when you see poverty in places like Rio de Janeiro, you understand that people, even Brazilians who migrate down from the Northeast, which is very warm, so people can also die, die from heat. Uh, people that came down from uh, semi-desert areas, you know, um, in Rio de Janeiro, you make a hole on, on a pipe and there's water. Um, you, you know, uh, shake the, the, the trash can, there's food there. Um, so it's uh, for me, even though Brazil has uh, a, is a country with, uh, I do not like to say a poor country, but a country with a very difficult, um, uh, high you know, difference between the poor and the, and the rich. So we have misery and we have uh, vastly richness. Um, it, I never lived and I never been to a complete miserable part of Brazil. But yeah, we have the type of scenario that you describe with people, you know, piling up of hunger, you know, uh, we had once upon a time, which is also amazing to me, even to pick it, even to picture this in, in Brazil, uh, as rich as it is on food, especially. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's unimaginable for me to, to, to understand that. And I think it's unimaginable, unimaginable for most of people to understand that. Uh, what I understand when I started um, searching for my family and, you know, the Portuguese and the Italians that migrate to Brazil, well, at some point, at that point that they migrated to Brazil, uh, there was famine in, in, in Europe. There was, uh, you know, post-war, well, in, in case there was pre-war scenario, mm -hmm. which was already a post-war scenario because there was always war, mm -hmm. um, you know, famine and all that. Uh, so I learned from the stories that I read uh, about my family that, um, you know, even the garden at some point was not, you know, as uh, um, rich and as wealth as it is today. So, yeah, I, I believe that most of people in the Americas, especially, uh, would have some kind of history, um, perhaps not as rush as that one, of course, uh, but also, you have to remember that many uh, migrated to Europe post-war and during mm -hmm. war. So, um, if people well, I mean, America, about North that, America had the, the Great Depression, right? The effects of which reverberated throughout the world because it was uh, an economic center. Uh, obviously, the 1920s, recovering from World War One, there was a lot of that as well. And then, of course, as you're saying, war, and then we're back to we're back to uh, you know, mass starvation events in, in the 1940s as well. So definitely there is a, a broader context to this, but um, specifically the siege of Leningrad that was almost 900 days. You know, the official estimates for the death toll were 
uh, around 600,000. Some people think it's closer to a million. And only a small percentage of those were, were military deaths, were soldiers. Most of those people were, uh, who died were civilian, and they died from starvation and from starvation-related diseases. And obviously, the cold in the winter months exacerbated the situation significantly. And like you're saying, in Brazil, it would be the opposite. It would be the heat um, and maybe some, some other countries too. So uh, just by looking at this, we already see that the, uh, the very idea of even having a child, having almost died, having had that type of uh, you know, health condition and having a child in, in one's 40s, it, it already seems a little bit almost miraculous, you know, being being rescued from a truck that was about to to take these uh, dead bodies or almost dead bodies away. Well, that's just one part of a family. If we look at the said president's father, he too escaped death on 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 many occasions. When Nazi Germany invaded the Soviet Union on June twenty second, nineteen forty one. He was working in defense contractor type situation um, in, in manufacturing. So he actually was exempt from uh, being mobilized, but he wanted, he wanted to participate. Uh, he wanted to participate directly uh, at the front. So now, Marcelo, imagine yourself. I'm not sure why I'm thinking of you as, as Putin's father, but you can. <laughs> <laughs> the Putin's father, but imagine yourself, you you don't have to go fight at the front, but you volunteer and you end up being part of this group, which on the one hand is a little bit safer, on the one hand, on the other hand is in more danger because you are part of a group that engages in sabotage in the Nazi German rear. You're going to different locations to do nasty shit to the enemy. You, for instance, would be blowing up their railroad track so that they would be unable to deliver equipment and other types of supplies, food, et cetera, et cetera. So, so this is your job and you are part of it. You're working with the uh, NKVD and in the Western mind, the NKVD is you know, it's an intelligence, it's an internal intelligence agency. It's usually uh, associated with the, you know, persecution of dissidents. But of course, the NKVD had multiple roles in, in World War II. It had this particular role of, um, you know, actually participating in, in the war effort. So imagine you are part of a detachment. There are 28 of you and you are out on multiple assignments on and on this particular assignment you are once again in the rear of the enemy you almost immediately get ambushed so something clearly went wrong maybe there was a traitor maybe a local mentioned or was forced to mention what he or she saw you're ambushed by the enemy and you you barely escape and the only place to go is to jump into, jump into the nearest body of water. The nearest body of water is a marsh. And you fully, fully submerge yourself. But obviously, you're not a fish. You can't stay underwater for more than a couple of minutes. What do you do? Well, you, you get a, you know, a reed, a plant. It's hollow. And you basically use it like a snorkel to, to stay underwater. And you cannot be seen. You cannot be detected. That's the only thing that's sticking out of the water and you stay underwater for a while until the danger is gone and you're able to escape. Now, if this sounds really crazy, um, I'll give you an example from my own family where we had a similar situation, but not in, in World War II, in World War I. And something similar happened to one of my ancestors. So this is my great, great, blah, 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 many greats, grandmothers, uh, family member. And he too was fighting Germans, not in World War II, but in World War I. And he too ended up having to jump into a body of water. Now, I'm not sure, I don't know enough. And I heard the story when I was a child. So way, way, way before any of this would have been publicized. So it's clearly something that is part of my family lore, which makes me think that I've never investigated this particular question that soldiers jumping into bodies of water to conceal themselves and try to save themselves is probably not as exceptional as it may seem at first glance. 
and being able to save yourself in this way. But anyway, this particular family member also jumped into either it was a marsh or a swamp, some kind of a grown over, you know, watery, uh, watery area, a, a body of water, and he was able to hide, but he was there for a long time. And maybe a doctor can correct me, but the family lore says that because he had some kind of partial hypothermia, he was unable to have children for the rest of his life because of the, the damage of, of sitting in cold water for, for so long, uh, hiding from, from the Germans in World War I, right? Again, so at first, I think to an outside observer, the initial story might sound really crazy until you hear that such, such stories, such family stories exist for, uh, for other families and in other cases, you know, in other cases, they're fully, uh, fully documented. So here you are, you escaped death, and out of the 28 men, only four survived. You're one of the surviving four. So, you know, we always talk about the, uh, the statistics for the death toll in the Soviet Union. The official death toll is around 27 million. Just under half of those, less than half, are actual military deaths. The rest are civilians. So obviously this is something that impacted many families, if not you know, almost every single family. And so for you, the, the percentage of survival in your particular group was quite small, yet you managed to survive. But that's not the, the only time where you face death. The other time is, is how you ended up in the hospital in the first place, where you stayed for a while and then you came to this apartment building to discover your nearly dead wife. You are now in Leningrad. You are participating in combat. You are no longer part of these sabotage troops uh, in operating in Nazi German rear. You are in Leningrad, but Leningrad is, is surrounded by, by Nazi Germany and with the help of their friends, Finland. And you are participating in, in fierce battle in, in this place that's called the Nevsky Pitachok. It's a very small area. And the reason you're there is because for a while there was a thought, an attempt that a breakthrough through the siege would be made from that particular location. It never actually happened, but this is one of the reasons why the battles were so fierce in this place. And apparently, according to researchers, there's so much metal in that area that you can walk around with a metal detector and it's just everything. It's just metal from all the from uh, from all the shooting repeatedly. In addition to this, the uh, Nazi German troops were at an advantage. That advantage, they were at an elevation, so it was very easy for them to shoot down uh, at this location. So this is where you are, and you get shot. And you don't die, of course. Eventually, you come to, and you manage to make it to the other troops. And this is late fall, early winter. St. Petersburg slash Leningrad, it's very cold, and the river, Niva, is frozen over. So in theory, it is possible for you to get across the river to, to, to get medical help. But no one is crazy enough to take you, a heavily wounded man, to a hospital because this is a completely open area. You would both get shot and, and killed. And so you are essentially left to die, but another miracle happens, your, your neighbor from outside of Leningrad, from Peterhof, happens, happens to be there. And he knows you. He knows you well. He recognizes you. And he volunteers to drag you across the ice to, to get help. And somehow, he, he makes it. He, he doesn't get shot. And you don't get killed. And you don't die in the process. And he, he gets medical help for you. And when your surgeries are over, according to you, your neighbor says, now you will live and I am off to die. And that's the last you hear of your neighbor for several, several decades. And then several decades later, you assume he died because, you know, he too is participating in the war effort. Several decades later, you are out and about. This is a peaceful time. It's the 1960s. Now, of course, there is the nuclear threat hanging over everyone's head, but at least it's not all out combat of World War II. And you go into the grocery store and you run into your neighbor and you recognize him. This is the man. This is the man who saved your life. You would not be here if it were not for this man. And you embrace each other and you come home and you sit down and you cry. 
And I'm no psychologist, obviously, but I suspect that even if you saw lots of deaths all around, you probably had a little bit of a survivor's gift, guilt in, in that type of a scenario because you assumed that the man who saved you, your neighbor, perhaps your friend, your acquaintance, uh, was no longer with us, partially, possibly because of you. And here he is, he's alive. And probably that was a moment of release and relief, uh, even for a man that seems to be very battle hardened that participated in some very dangerous situations. Uh, and so you cry. And so your survival uh, was not guaranteed to say the least in at least two of these cases and neither was your wives. And somehow you went on to live and you went on to, to have this, this child in 1952 went on to become the leader of the biggest country in the world. But that's not your only child. You had another child. And this child was, his name was Victor. He was about three years old during the siege. And because the food situation was so dire in Leningrad, the authorities were trying to evacuate people. And you remember our very first episode with our expert from St. Petersburg who talked in great detail about the conditions of the siege and specifically he talked about evacuations uh, and the different means of evacuate, evacuating people, mainly children and women. And he talked about the road of life, right? Trying to evacuate people in winter was over ice, um, of course, and very, very dangerous, but nonetheless, uh, hundreds of thousands of people were evacuated, many successfully, and they were evacuated way, way, way into the sort of towards the Urals of the Soviet Union. So as, as far away from, from the capital even as, as possible. And so your son and your wife's son, Victor, who is only three years old, he, he's, not very, he's not doing very well. He's little, there's not enough food. And this is when you, you end up in a hospital. And so every time your wife comes to visit you, she secretly, of course, with your help, takes whatever food you're getting at the hospital to give just a little bit more to your little toddler. And the hospital staff doesn't realize this is happening until you start fainting from hunger in the hospital. And then you can no longer do that. You can no longer feed your child. And success your child your child will be evacuated he will be saved but he's taken away he gets sick he gets diphtheria and he dies and until the rest of your life and your wife's life you have no idea exactly what happened to him where he's buried and when he died it's only in the 2000s that researchers open up the archives and they find information on the little toddler Viktor Putin and how he died in the siege or as a result of the siege of Leningrad. And this, this little brother that Vladimir Putin never met because he was born almost a decade after his, his little brother died, um, he always he always thinks about his brother. We've seen multiple interviews and statements when Putin talks about his family. He talks about World War II. He's very knowledgeable about his family's history. There are some very detailed quotations about, for instance, the battle that I described to you at Nevsky Pitechok. And he he always thinks about this brother, the brother that he never met. And I think having having that type of family history has been very, very formative to him. And this is the question that I'm trying to tackle in my mind. And it's a question that I thought about for a long time. So uh, I, when I was in, in grad school, studying very detailed modern, modern Russian history, in addition to some other topics, one of the tangential questions, it wasn't the main question that came up in the lecture was the extent to which uh, Joseph Stalin's psychology informed his politics and his decision making. And this particular historian really amplified paranoia and some negative personality traits um, that perhaps made Stalin act the way he did as 
not just a very shrewd leader, but obviously a very ruthless leader. And at the time, I didn't really like that because I didn't really think psychology was as important as I do these days. It was later with when I've had some mm, negative experiences with some maladaptive personality types that I sort of became an armchair psychologist and researched abnormal psychology for myself. And of course, we're not thinking about abnormal psychology. We can think about all, all types of traumatic responses, effects, et cetera, et cetera not just, let's say, personality disorders, that I started to think that psychology is much more relevant to the way people operate, um, even in their jobs, than I used to think when I was in grad school. 